All right, welcome back to ABA exam review and the continuation of our BCBA practice exam series where we're going through another set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're turning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass your exam, please let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. A functional behavior assessment indicates several possible behaviors that Frederick can target. Frederick has limited resources and knows he can't target all the behaviors, so he starts to do a cost-benefit analysis to help focus his plan. He knows behavior A is going to be much easier to teach and master, but carries no social validity, while behavior B could present a challenge, but should also offer meaningful change in the client's life. What should Frederick decide? Your job for this question is to take the information available to Frederick and make the best decision possible. That's all we're trying to ever do, just make the best decision possible. In this case, Frederick has done a cost-benefit analysis, and a cost-benefit analysis is when we weigh the cost of an intervention or a behavior versus the benefits. What is the resource cost? What is it going to, going to cost us to target? And what are the benefits of targeting that or using that intervention? So for behavior A, it's going to be easier to teach and master, but has no social validity. That's a big problem because we need to target socially valid behaviors. Behavior B will be challenging, but it's going to be more meaningful. What should Frederick decide? Target behavior A and not behavior B since behavior A will be mastered quickly. We're not just focused on how quickly we can get something mastered or done. We need to make sure it's meaningful. Behavior A is not meaningful. B, target behavior B and not behavior A since behavior B is socially valid. Yes. The deciding factor in the cost benefit is target the behavior that's going to make a meaningful change. C, target both behaviors as behavior A won't take much of Frederick's time. It's got no, no social validity. So instead of wasting time on that behavior, let's target meaningful change. And then D, target none of the behaviors until he is able to find more resources. If he can do behavior B, which it seems like he can, we have to target B because B is socially valid. A speech therapist is helping a child improve their conversational skills. During sessions, the therapist asks questions such as, what do you eat for breakfast and what color is the sky? The child is encouraged to answer these questions with appropriate responses like cereal or blue. The therapist is focusing on increasing the child's ability to respond to questions without visual prompts or direct cues. What is the therapist working on? Very straightforward verbal behavior question. When you get an easy question, Trust your preparation, don't overthink, answer it, move on. What is the therapist working on? Well, they're asking questions and then getting answers. So the child is engaging in these intraverbals because the therapist does not want the child to answer with visual prompts or cues. They want the child to answer the question. They want the verbal behavior to be evoked by another verbal stimulus, but to not have point-to-point -point correspondence which is going to make this an interverbal. If we look at A in a coic, and a coic would be copying, and the therapist does not want the child to copy. They want them to answer the question. B mans would be a request. The child is not making a request. They're having a conversation. So the therapist is working on C, interverbals. D autoclitics has to do with describing your own verbal behavior. So easy question. We trust our preparation. Answer it. Move on. Victoria is working to establish a measurement system for a new behavior that was just observed by one of her technicians. Victoria usually likes to, to use discontinuous measurements for these types of behavior, but is open to trying anything that works. The main priority is that the technician must observe the client the entire time during measurement, even if using a discontinuous measurement. What procedure is it not necessary for the technician to observe the client the entire time they are measuring behavior? Interesting question here, right? Let's focus on what the question wants to know. It wants to know what procedure is it not necessary to observe the client the entire time. So the rest of the question doesn't even necessarily matter. This is why we work so hard on the question and what the question is telling us and makes our answer choices so much easier. We're looking for a procedure where we don't have to observe the client the entire time. What measurements can you think of where we don't have to observe the client the whole time? A, momentary time sampling. If I have an interval of 30 seconds, 
I don't have to watch the client until the interval is over. So I don't have to observe the client the entire time with the momentary time sampling procedure. What about B, a permanent product? With the permanent product, that's the whole idea, right? We are just measuring the product, not necessarily the behavior. So we're not observing the client the entire time. With a partial interval recording, C, even though it's discontinuous, you still have to observe the client the whole time. Because if you have a 30 second interval and the client doesn't engage in responses, you've got to watch that whole 30 seconds. So what procedure is it not necessary for the technician to observe the client the entire time? Well, it's going to be both A and B, permanent product and momentary time sampling. Although used less than other single case experimental designs, the changing criteria on design is effective at both increasing and reducing behavior in a systematic way. Which of the following answer choices is true about a changing criterion design? So the changing criterion design is the least used experimental design in research, but it can still be effective and is still a valid way of increasing and decreasing known behaviors. The question wants to know, what is true about the changing criterion design? It's a must be true question. A, the target behavior should be novel. When using a changing criterion design, the target behavior needs to be known, not novel. So B, the target behavior should be known, is the true answer. We want a behavior that already exists because all we're going to be doing is increasing or decreasing that behavior. C, you should never go backwards once you've changed the criterion in the design. Well, that's not true. If we want to establish functional control or demonstrate it, a good way of doing that is changing criterions and then moving backwards and going back because we need that behavior to stick to our changes. And then D, the behaviors are measured intermittently rather than repeatedly. Well, in single subject and single case designs, repeated measures is one of our characteristics. So what is true about a changing criterion design? Target behavior should be known. A child with autism struggles engaging in non-preferred activities, so his analyst sets up a workstation with non-preferred activities like worksheets and coloring sheets. The child isn't giving any instructions, but a technician does observe and measure the child's engagement for 20 minutes. What type of procedure is likely being used here? Let's think about the scenario, right? Because it's a procedure question. We have a situation where a child is at a workstation with non-preferred activities and coloring sheets, but they aren't giving any instructions and the technician is simply observing and measuring. Whenever you see a child-led instruction or just an observation, we want to think preoperant. Why is it not a discrete trial? Well, with discrete trial, the technician would be giving, giving SDs, giving feedback. It'd be rapid. It'd be engaging. The technician is not engaging. They're observing. They're letting the child lead. So this is much more likely a free operant procedure. Why is it not incidental? Well, the, with an incidental teaching procedure, we're taking advantage of naturally occurring teaching opportunities with engagement. Here, the technician is observing and measuring. Task analysis procedures would be breaking down behaviors into smaller steps. No task analysis is taking place. What is happening here is a free operant observation at the hands of the technician. A three-year-old refers to all of her toys as her friends. This is true of toys that look like animals, toys that look like cartoon characters, and even some toys that are shaped like vehicles. The toys not sharing characteristics, but acting as a stimulus class would make these toys what? Okay, very straightforward stimulus class question, right? These stimulus, all these stimuli are evoking the behavior or response of friends. Some it look like animals, some look like cartoons, some are shaped like vehicles. So they aren't sharing characteristics. They don't have topographies in common, but they are part of a class. So what will we consider these toys, specifically the fact that they aren't sharing characteristics? A, arbitrary. Yes, arbitrary stimuli, stimulus classes are made up of stimuli that don't share common characteristics. What about B, functional? This does appear to be a functional stimulus class, but the question specifically asked about the toys not sharing characteristics. You got to read carefully and be precise. Formal, well, we know it's not a formal similarity, right? Because it's arbitrary. 
and then consequential. What is in the consequence? These are antecedents. So yes, these are likely part of a functional stimulus class, but more importantly, because we're answering the question, they are arbitrary. Abby is taking items she knows her client likes and allowing her clients to choose which one they will work for during each work interval. Abby then makes note of if the chosen item increases the likelihood that the client will complete work during those intervals. What type of assessment is Abby likely conducting? Okay, be careful here. Don't confuse this for a preference assessment. Think about it. We have Abby. She has items she, know her, she knows her clients like. She already is aware of what her clients like and what they're going to choose to work for. Now she's looking, do those items change the client's behavior? Are they going to increase the client completing work during those intervals? So what is she doing? If she's allowing them to choose what they will work for and then taking data on what changes behavior, what type of assessment is she doing? A, an indirect reinforcer assessment. Well, this is an indirect. Abby is directly observing and directly taking data. She is, however, doing B, a reinforcer assessment. C, a single choice preference assessment. She's already got the preferences. Now she's checking for reinforcing properties. And then D, a functional analysis. Functional analysis is when we are manipulating antecedents and consequences to figure out functions. Abby isn't doing that. She is simply looking at if these items have reinforcing properties. A researcher examining the effects of remote service delivery is taking data across three different participants. All three participants are participating in the study at the same time, and baseline data is collected simultaneously. The researcher does collect baseline data intermittently, however. What type of experimental design does this most resemble? So we've got another experimental design question. We're trying to identify the type. Let's break this down. We have a researcher breaking, taking data across three different participants. Immediately, when you see that across three different participants, we are thinking multiple baseline or multiple probe, right? This is what we're thinking, because we have one, two, three. These are our participants, our baselines, and our interventions. Now, the question specifies all are participating in the study at the same time, so it appears concurrent, because everything's happening at once, but baseline is collected intermittently. So if we're collecting baseline, not on a continuous basis, what are we using? A, a concurrent multiple probe design. Yes, this is a concurrent design, a concurrent multiple probe design because it's happening all at once, but we're not taking continuous baseline data. B, a non-concurrent multiple baseline design. That is wrong on both fronts. It is concurrent and it's a multiple probe. C, delayed multiple baseline design. It isn't delayed. Everything is happening at the same time. D, non-concurrent multiple probe design. It is a multiple probe, but it is also concurrent. Rochelle notices that her behavior technicians are very competent when working one-on-one -on -one with clients. However, when they are working in a group setting like in the clinic or during social skills, Rochelle notices that reinforcement is often delayed and the wrong behaviors are receiving the consequence. What is Rochelle focusing on? Let's think about what Rochelle is concerned with. We're focused on Rochelle's behavior. She sees that her technicians are competent, which is great, but during group settings, the reinforcement is delayed and the wrong behaviors are receiving the consequence. Why is that an issue? Well, if we have a target behavior and we are waiting to deliver reinforcement, then the wrong response is going to get reinforced. What does Rochelle want to fix? A, automaticity. Automaticity just says the learner or the participant isn't aware of the reinforcement or being reinforced. That is not the issue here. The issue here is B, contiguity, the closeness of the reinforcement to the right behavior. There needs to be more contiguity where the reinforcement is quicker in reinforcing the right behavior. C, non-contingent reinforcement. We're not running a non-contingent reinforcement intervention in this question. And then D, observer drift. Observer drift has to do with how we're measuring something and how it can change over time. That's not the problem. The problem is the closeness or the contiguity of the consequence. A behavior technician is told to measure and record how often a child waves at strangers. The behavior is defined as any time the child raises their hand and completes a full hand wave while looking directly at a stranger. Over time, the technician starts to count any time the child engages with the stranger 
even if they do not wave what is occurring. So interestingly enough, we just discussed this idea, right? In the last question, we have a situation where we are measuring how often a child waves at strangers. The behavior is child raising hand with a full hand wave while looking directly at the stranger. But as time goes on, now, anytime the child engages with the stranger, even without a wave, it counts. What's changed? Well, how we measure has changed. So what do we call that? A, treatment drift. Treatment drift has to do with how the intervention is being implemented, and we're worried about the measurement here. What about B, observer bias? It doesn't appear that it's a bias issue, but it is a drift issue. The technician is experiencing observer drift. And there is not IOA recording because this is not an IOA question, no inter-observer question. The answer here is observer drift. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe and check out behavioranalyststudy.com. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.